Well, um, welcome to the fourth uh, workshop on statistical physics. Um, vamos a hacer los cursillos en inglés uh, porque hay personas que no hablan español. Entonces, um, so I uh, turn to English. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Um, it's a school we've been doing it since 2011, and it's uh, we're very happy to do now the, the fourth uh, version. In, in 2020, we have to cancel it because of the pandemic. So it's great to be here again. Um, we have a few words from the Vice uh, Dean of Research of the School of Science, uh, Jenny Hernandez. So. Um, thank you. Um, well, as Gabriel said, uh, you're all very welcome to this workshop. We are really happy to, to have you here. And this is actually um, uh, an effort that Universidad Nacional de Colombia and Universidad de los Andes have put into constructing um, a stronger community on statistical physics. So thank you, Professor Jose Daniel Muñoz. Thank you, uh, Gabriel Tejos, for putting all this effort in, into this. And um, I, I won't hold you long, and I hope you have all a week of great discussions and learning. So, um, so I'll pass the word to Juan Jose Daniel. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you, thank you to the Anden University, and for Gabriel and me, it's a privilege and and uh, uh, a question of happiness to have you here and to to be in the fourth workshop. No. After six years, you no, know, we are we we are starting again with this effort we that we we used to have every three years. So I hope you will be in contact and you will be also in the next one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I we also want to thanks uh, Professor Hans Herman, Professor Berghofer, and Professor Manzano for coming and accepting our invitation. Yes. Uh, is a privilege and uh, okay, and be free of asking any language, in any language. No, the conferences and so will be in English, most of them. But if you want to speak in Spanish, it's no problem. No, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, we also want to thank all people who have uh, um, helped us to make this uh, workshop a reality. So especially the Faculty of Science of the Andean University, no, the um, the vice rector, vice uh, president of research here at the Andean University, the the uh, Institute of uh, Foreign Affairs of the National University, the Department of Physics, and the Faculty of Science. So thank you very much, and please enjoy this week working on statistical physics. Thank you. So as you know, this uh, meeting will be hybrid. So one more or less, one half of the people will be online and the other people will be here. No, usually we have three days of mini courses and two days of conferences. And the three day, uh, the mini courses will be in one university and the conference and the other one, and we shift places every three years. So this time the mini courses will be here and the Andean University and the conferences will be at the National University. Um, so, and Wednesday afternoon is free, no? As always. Um, so, uh, please enjoy. If you need anything, please contact us, Gabriel or me. And we are ready then for the first, for the first mini course, no? And this will be uh, in, the, in the hands of Professor Hans Hermann. Yeah, and it will be on advanced topics on percolation. So, I guess we are on time. So, or we are still in advance. It's time to start. Yeah. See, I Eduardo.
ถึงนะครับที่จะชอบคือโอเคโอเคคนนั้นจะสุดที่เอาเลยพระเอกพระเอกโน้ตโอเคโน้ตโอเคที่ก็เคนยินดีเคฮาร์มิอิตราสกูดมอร์นิ่งไอ้ผมรู้สึกดีที่มาที่นี่และถ้าคุณมีคำถามในช่วงการเรียนของผมขอให้ช่วยอนุญาตผมไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบไม่ต้องการคำตอบ Sí, pero eso eso dónde fue? Esto es la carribita. Sí, pero no está más. ¿Dónde está la carribita? Eso hay que hay que salir otra vez de aquí, ¿no? Lo pago, ¿no? Lo pago, no sé. Claro. Dejarme compartir. No, para que no salga eso y poder estarlo de acá arriba. Pues sí, para seguro. Para entonces acá y en esa Y ahora sí compartir, ahora sí entrar al Zoom y compartir. Ahora, el Zoom, ah, el Zoom, ahí. Está donde el Zoom aquí. Acá. Ah, sí, aquí está. <ríe> sí, otra vez lo mismo. Ay, 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 ay. Y, ¿Y ahora, ahora sí, por favor. Nada. <ríe> No. Yeah. Okay. Listos. Bueno, I'm sorry. So I'm supposed to speak in English. Um. So I will spend these three hours, of course, to tell you the details about percolation theory. Who of you has already heard something about percolation? Okay. So you will learn more. So this is the outline of my course. First, I will tell you something basic, which will be mostly today. Then I will talk about some fractal subsets and some dynamic on percolation, variance of percolation, and then percolation on correlated surfaces, the Schrammler evolution, explosive percolation, and if I have time, break down more. So I have more than 200 slides, so we go slowly as far as we can. If I don't reach the end, it doesn't matter. Okay, so percolation is a mathematical model that was invented by this British mathematician, Mr. Hammersley, in 57. And, uh, and uh, from there on, there were two communities, mathematically and physically oriented, one. But first, let me uh, give you some 
basic information. So there exist several books which are exclusively dedicated to percolation. The most uh, recommended one is the one by Stauffer. And actually the first edition, which is not as exist anymore, was better than the second one because it had all the jokes which were removed by Harori. And, um, and then here I have a book which explains a lot about application in oil industry. And then these two books here, they as look at the mathematical aspect of percolation, which is a, another community. So what does a percolation mean? Percolation in English is when a fluid goes through a solid. And this object is called a percolator. So percolation is in the, let's say, public view, just uh, how to connect one side to the other. And it is applied, the model that I will describe in this course, is applied to many situations in which you have this transport through a disordered medium. For instance, in the oil production, where you have, of course, the percolation of oil through the soil. But then in many other applications, which I've written down here, here the soil gel transition, reporting of conductors and, and non-conductors, insulators, forest fires, epidemics, and then some very more exotic applications. <laughs> So yo, but you're not a gripa. If I thought it's too close, maybe too close. I'm sorry. Maybe you put it somewhere lower. Um, so there exist some more exotic applications to percolation, like in social social physics, or like in financial physics, like in physics, which uh, are also explored. So I'm sorry. This has been advancing by itself a lot. We go back. <laughs> so. Okay, so I will give you the example of the soil gel transition. The soil, soil gel transition is what happens when you put gelatin in the fridge and it comes from a fluid, it transforms into a solid. And this is a transition, a phase transition, in which you have, this is the problem, in which you have small monomers which uh, start to, which start to, aggregate to react to form chains and they big big for they start like a, a soul and then they start to create larger and larger clusters until there is a specific time at which a cluster appears that spans the system and this spanning cluster is called the gel and the transition between these two is the soul gel transition and what you see is there is this percolation of an object from one side to the other so this is a percolation transition. And this can be measured experimentally, it is measured experimentally by looking at the viscosity of, um, of the soil and see how the viscosity diverges when you approach this critical point. And then you can see how the shear modulus increases from zero starting from this point. So this is the typical that's a trademark of a phase transition. And this is a, an application of percolation. But this is, as I said, only a physical application while percolation in reality is a mathematical model. Oops. And this is what I want to define now. So let us consider a lattice, the square lattice. And you occupy a certain fraction of the sides of this lattice with probability P. So P is the parameter of the model. So you see, I see, you see here now three different realizations with different p. And you see now, if you have a small p, then there, there are only some groups of these black or gray clusters, this cluster, I mean, sites, and it is impossible to go from here to here just on top of the gray ones. If you have a lot of gray ones, then you can spend, you can go easily from one side to the other, just along the nearest neighbor connections. And there's a transition between the two at which for the first time you have this spanning, spanning cluster going through. And this is the percolation transition. Okay? So you can do this. This is now what's called site percolation because you occupy the sides of this lattice. You can also instead occupy the bonds, the connections randomly with a certain probability. And then you have a bond percolation problem. So exist site percolation and bond percolation. And the notion that you need to define percolation. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 
Aquí, bueno, este es el físico aquí. Vamos a hacer acá. Así, ah, bueno. Ok, so let's see. So this, you need to have a definition of connectedness. And in this case, my connectedness was the nearest neighbors are connected. I mean, you can also make next nearest neighbors connection if you want, the principle. You can define more arbitrary, more general population connectivities. That doesn't work. <laughs> and then there's a concept of the cluster. A cluster is uh, the ensemble of all the, the sites which are connected to each other. So here are the small clusters, here you have big clusters, and here you have one huge cluster, which is actually the percolation clusters. Now this big, big uh, object is a percolation cluster. Okay, so now this is the definition of percolation. Is there any question? No? So this, is, this must be clear, because if you don't understand the definition model, then you have problems. Okay, so now we will discuss how can I decide on the computer if I have a percolation or not. And there you can use what is called the burning method. The burning method, which I introduced many years ago, actually, is the following. You have to put on top of this side, you put fire. And you imagine that every dry side is a tree that can burn. And so you start now by burning the neighbors, because the connectivity was nearest neighbors. So you start and burn all the neighbors of the burning sites. And this is now time two. The first was time one, now this is time two. And then you burn all the neighbors of burning sites that are occupied by a tree and have not yet burned. And this is now the time number three. And though, so you go ahead, you have four, five, six, so you time, you, you propagate your fire from nearest neighbor to nearest neighbor. Force and so on, I was, I was lazy to finish. So you arrive and finally at time 24 to the other end. And if you don't arrive to the other end, it means you have no spanning cluster. So the condition of having a spanning cluster is that you are able to come to the end. So there, there is a, sorry, this is so very, very sensitive. Okay, so there is this before, besides, sorry, besides the definition of this cluster, we can also define now the shortest path, which is some guy that we are going to encounter now many times tomorrow and after tomorrow again. And the shortest path is this, this, this short, the line that is below is, is the line of it got, this is first here. The first time you reach this end, this is the shortest, the shortest path. Okay. Now, if you want to decide, de determine the percolation transition with precision, you have to realize that you are working always with finite systems. In finite systems, you have fluctuations. Sometimes you have a, you you transition a little bit before, sometimes a little later, so it's never precisely at exactly PC. So what you do is you look at many samples, and each time you look what is the PC of the sample, and then you write down the probability distribution of finding the, a certain transition uh, PC for a sample. That means you ask how many samples have had a PC of a certain value, and you write and put down this curve. And then you make this thing for different system sizes. And you will see that if you increase the system size, this curve becomes steeper and steeper until it becomes a step function at PC. And if you now, for instance, watch for different sizes, the inflection point, how the inflection point moves, or, or how uh, another characteristic point of this curve moves, then you can extrapolate very precisely to the value of the transition point, OK? So this is one technique. Later, I will tell you more precise ways to obtain the critical percolation threshold. So here for this, you can then see that PC for site percolation on the square lattice is a value which well, it's some, nobody knows this value. One of the challenges is to calculate this number. And so for every different lattice and for site and for bond percolation, you have now this PC, this, this threshold value at which you have the transition. This can be obtained, and some of these values are exact. Those that have stars here are exact. This, for the triangular lattice, if we come back to this, for bond percolation, no, side percolation, triangular lattice, it's exactly one half. This can be obtained by self duality, and the same is true for the bond square lattice. And then there exist also two others which are 
which can be calculated exactly, with so-called dual transformation. So otherwise, every odd number is, is only known numerically. Yes, sir. Um, this is a composition probability of, of each side is independent of of, of the others. I mean, uh, once a, a square is occupied, uh, this affect uh, the neighboring. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. It's a very important point. The occupation is done independently, randomly, independently for every site. So every site, you choose a random number and it's independent of the other random numbers. Otherwise, you have something called, called coordinated percolation, but this we come to talk about this later. Okay. Okay? okay. Good. So um, we continue. So now we have to discuss, to be more precise about the phase transition. And phase transitions are characterized by so-called order parameters, like the magnetization in the magnetic phase transition. So which is the order parameter of percolation? The order parameter is the probability to find a site in the infinite cluster. Or in other words, the fraction of sites that belong to this infinite cluster, the spanning cluster. Yes, this, we only consider the spanning cluster. And so before we reach the, the, the percolation threshold, there is no spanning cluster. And therefore, it is zero. And here is the percolation threshold. And from here on, you see that the spanning cluster becomes stronger and stronger. And uh, this, this decay to zero now occurs with a power law. going With a power law, yes, like this, as P minus PC. We will see these cow power laws many times. This is typical for critical points. And um, the exponent beta, which is the typical exponent for the order parameter, is uh, known in two dimensions exactly, in three dimensions, of course, not. So this order parameter, you have to remember, this is something which we'll use all the time again and again. So besides the infinite cluster, the largest cluster, we also have many small clusters. And the crucial property for the calculation of all the properties of percolation is the cluster size distribution. It's what is called also the generating function or the partition function of this problem. So the cluster size distribution is how many clusters you have of a certain size. And it's described by NS number of, number of uh, this is the number of clusters of size S that have S sites divided by the total number of sites. Okay? So here I show you a small movie where you can see um, what happens when I change PC. So you have many small clusters as PC, but PC is very small. And then when PC is very one, you have one big cluster. This is green is one cluster. But if you go down, then suddenly you get more and more small holes. Then here come the transition and you have many big clusters. And when you go down, you have many small clusters. So for P equals zero, we have many small clusters. For P equals one, we have one big cluster. And at this region of the transition, we have clusters of all sizes. We will see this more precisely later. So now I would like to again discuss an algorithm. Who of you has already heard about this algorithm of Hosen and Koppelmann? Okay, so this is, you know, many of you will learn the same thing new. So um, it is the following. I will tell you an algorithm how to obtain this cluster size distribution, how to identify all the clusters in a percolation configuration in which you only go once through the system. And you go once through the system, line by line, and after that, you know the cluster size distribution. It's a very beautiful algorithm, which if you, once you have programmed it in your life, you will never forget. So what you do is the following. You, you, you put the occupied sites, you call one, and then the unoccupied sites, the empty sites, you call zero, okay? This is your matrix. And now you start from the left upper side and you now look at what is my first occupied site, which is my first cluster. And then you identify this first occupied site and give him a label, a number, which is then two. Because one you have already used to say it's occupied, to so put it two. And then you go further 
And each time you encounter a site, you look if the site is connected to your cluster already, and you give it the same label. Or otherwise, if it is disconnected from the site, then you give it a new label. So every time you encounter a new cluster, you give it a new label. And then on the same time, you have a, a vector, m of, oh, m of k, which is the mass of the cluster number k. And so each time you add a site, you make a one, plus one. Each time you see a site, has, it has a, 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 a new site in my cluster, you do mk plus, plus one. But if now you encounter a site which has two neighbors from the same cluster, it means that you're connecting two clusters, then you decide that this, that one of those is a real label, and the other one is just added. So that you say, okay, I decide K1 is the real label. So I put all the mass into K1 and K2. Now I make a negative number where K is the index, the flag of the root. It means K1. So that I have stored in my system just now these one and zero to, to say occupy empty, then the positive integers as flags and the negative integers as roots. It's very elegant, you must admit. Yeah? And then at the end, when you want to know all the cluster sizes, you make a loop through all the M of K. And each time you encounter a negative number, you know, this is the root. This is not the root, I have to find the root. And you have a small infinite loop that goes back and find the root, and then you have the value of the size of the, of, of, of the mass. So this is an algorithm that I very much recommend because they can use it not only for population, it's a general algorithm to identify clusters. By the way, Raoul Koppelman died July this year. So yeah, anyway, so this is a, the algorithm of Koppelman and Koppelman. Any question? Okay. No, it's difficult to ask questions at this point. You have to implement it yourself, and you will understand much better. Okay, so I show you now here how it works. So you start putting here the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, the seven, then this is also two, yeah, of course. And this is now new eight, but then now you connect, you see this is the same. So here you see this was three, and you see next, you see, this is how the whole problem works. So they are connected, you see again, these two are together with this one. This was, the root was here three, and this one here, the root was, now the nine is, the root is now of nine is now eight. So here's, here for nine is minus eight, and for three, that is, for nine there is minus three. For eight is minus nine, and for nine is minus three. Okay, and so on, you see, this is how, how it works. So you label, and each time you see there is a cluster that cl closes, Oh, sorry, it, uh, it closes. So I mean, here you see that the cluster three has to be growing quite fast. Okay, so this is the implementation of this uh, hosen koppelmann algorithm. So next, let us discuss how does this cluster size distribution look like? So for all values of P except PC, the cluster size distribution is exponentially decaying. So you see above PC, Above PC, it decays exponentially with some, ex with some power law in the S, so weird a little bit. And below PC, there's a power law in front. So it's not, nothing is perfectly exponential, but there are roughly exponential decays. So this has been studied a lot. It's not so interesting. What is more interesting is what happens at PC exactly, at the transition point. And there you find that the cluster size distribution is a power law. Yeah? So as I said before, there is, an in, there is a, if no characteristic size. There are clusters of all sizes at PC because a power law has no characteristic length. And there is this tau, which is the, the exponent of the decay, which again is known exactly in two dimensions and which you can show can never be smaller than two and never be larger than in 2.5, this mass conservation implies that it must be larger than, than two. Okay, so there exists now a very important scaling law for this cluster size distribution. And this is so-called Stauffer scaling because he was the, y, 
one who invented the scaling. And this we will explore the scaling very much because the scaling laws are typical for critical points. So you see, he have he have this uh, pre-factor which decides what is happens at PC because if you are at PC, then this is zero and this becomes a constant. And this here is a scaling function. It's a function that depends on a combination of two variables. A scaling law is nothing but that you have a function that depends on two variables where you can show that at the end of the day, it depends only on one variable, which is this one. This is the variable on which actually the scaling function depends. So it's a tricky thing which you can explore and get interesting results from this. It in particular means that you can collapse all the data for different P and different S on a single curve just by putting this below on the other side and then plotting directly the scaling function as function of this argument. So this here, this argument is this argument here. And this axis here is nothing but an S divided by S to the minus tau. And so this is a very nice numerical verification of the scaling law. These data were made by hand by Stauffer in the 70s. This is an old, old plot, yes. So this is Stauffer in Paris. So fine, fine. <laughs> so um, yes. So once you have this uh, scaling law, you know actually everything on the different moments of uh, the terminal uh, of the plasma side distribution. So the second moment, yes, which I write here like a susceptibility because it plays the role of susceptibility. There's something I should say which I will not discuss in this talk, which is that percolation has a very important theoretical function in, theoretic, in statistical physics because it is the Q equals one limit of the so-called POTS model. I will mention this a little bit. POTS model, you have something to write? You, must, you have something to write? I have. You have something to write, yes. Ah, okay, gracias. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. So let me just say POTS model, is a generalization of the Ising model. As a Hamiltonian, it equals minus j sum over nearest neighbors of delta of, of delta of sigma one, sigma of I, or I sigma j. And these sigmas now are values between zero, are sigma, sigma i are values between uh, let's say one into until Q. So you have Q different possible discrete values for sigma. And uh, this Hamiltonian now, as I said, depends on Q because Q is the number of variables that you have, okay? And uh, what you can show is that of course Q, Q equals two is the icing model, but in the limit of Q equals going to one, which sounds a little weird, you retrieve bond percolation. And in that sense, there is a complete formalism to identify the critical properties of percolation with the critical properties of the icing model. And so one can say that this second moment of the cluster size distribution corresponds to the susceptibility of the icing model in this POTS model description. This is now just something I will not discuss in detail because I had to make a choice what I want to do and what I will not do. I had to kind of decide not to do that. But anyway, this, uh, second moment or this response function it has this detail that is the sum over all clusters except the largest cluster. Because if you would take the largest cluster, then of course it's just infinite all the time. And so this function has the property that it diverges at PC. Yes, by close at PC then it's, uh, it's, uh, these fluctuations then diverge. And uh, then it diverges here with an exponent, which is a gamma and which uh, actually is of course then related to tau and sigma. I mean, you can show this uh, easily if you want. Uh, you have a, actually it's interesting to see because later we'll see cases where it doesn't work. So if you have, a, maybe I put it here this way. If you have here sum over S to the K, let's say the Kth moment in S, you can transform this sum into an integral from zero to infinity. And then you have here s to the minus to f to the k, k to the k times 
the scaling function of this we have with ns, which is s to the minus tau, and then the scaling function of p minus pc times s to the sigma. Okay, I just insert then ds ds. So I have now this description. Now I will make a substitution. I will call this x. And if I do the substitution, you see that uh, I get now from here. I, I have here that I can get this p minus pc out of this integral. Yes, I have p minus pc, which comes from here, from this substitution, in, in s to the k minus tau. So we have here this to the one over sigma coming from here. Then everything here to the power k minus tau. And from that side here, we have another piece, other p minus pc, pc to the power one over sigma. And if you put this together, you see that we have here then, this goes like, P minus PC to the power what? To the power K plus one plus one, but it goes here, minus tau over sigma. Yeah. So this is a, a little far away, but anyway. So you can, if you have the exponents tau and sigma, then you have all the moments. And we later encounter the so-called multifractals where this is not the case. And this is why I'm told, showing you this here. Okay, so, oh my God, I'm sorry. This, this runs always away. So, okay, here we go. So, <laughs> um, so we have uh, already encountered several critical exponents. We have encountered beta, gamma, sigma, tau. And there are many more of these exponents, as you see. <laughs> but as I said, they are all related. Essentially, only two different exponents, I mean, sigma and tau. Everything else is related. And then there are some two remarks. One remark is in two dimensions, we know all these things exactly. This is not trivial. This is the percolation has not been solved completely like IC models, not that we don't know this full solution, but we know these numbers from conformal invariance and some other things. We'll discuss a little bit about later. And then there is this in dimension six. In dimension above dimension six, there is there is no change in the exponents because there you have what is called mean field, and the frontier between mean field and non-mean field is this is this called critical dimension six. So this is typical for the POTS model. In general, the POTS model in general has always uh, the upper critical dimension six. Okay, and um, yes, uh, now let's uh, look at what happens at the critical point. Um, you remember that at the critical point, the order parameter goes to zero, is zero, is zero. So my question to you is, does the infinite cluster exist at PC or not? The probability to find a site in the infinite cluster is zero. Does it exist or does it not exist? This is a question to, to you. Everybody has, can give me a, a, an answer here. But how can we solve this problem? I've already, I mean, the solution is on the blackboard. <laughs> so it exists, but it is not a, not a compact object. It is a fractal. And since it's a fractal, the, its density goes to zero when it becomes larger and larger. I don't know who many, how many of you know what a fractal is. I mean, I guess everybody who knows what is a fractal. Uh, okay, so this is something I will go very fast. Okay, so what you can see now is at PC, if you look at the size of the largest cluster of the infinite cluster at PC, yes, then it grows like the system size to this crazy number, which is the fractal dimension, and which again in two dimensions is known exactly, and in three dimensions is a, is numerical. And um, of course, the fractal dimension is always smaller than the dimension of space. There's a relation, as I said, between these exponents which will later pop out uh, automatically. So this I will prove to you in a few minutes. Okay, so I will now, this is one fractal object that we have, but then remember we introduced the shortest path and the shortest path also is fractal. Yeah, you see it's a very tenuous object there, even in four dimensions, it's fractal dimension is smaller than two. So it's nearly a line, yes, very thin and, uh, and uh, yes, this is a 
numerical calculation of this uh, fractal dimension. And interestingly, this exponent of, of the, the, it's called d-min, yes, is uh, a challenge. This is the only exponent that nobody has any idea how to calculate. Amazing, yes. But anyway, we know it numerically very, very precisely, but this is a challenge for the future. Even in two dimensions, there's no way, uh, many suggestions and hypotheses and conjectures, but I mean, nothing very, nothing stable, nothing exact. Okay, so now I will make a very brief survey through fractality. So fractality, of course, there are many books of fractality. Since you all know fractality, just remind you that the main condition for being fractal is self-similarity. Eh? They meet this property without not, fractality does not mean the, the dimension is a fractal. It means that you have system is self-similar, has this property of self-similarity, which I show you here. Then of course, everybody imagine has seen this thing. Uh, this calculation of Sierpinski gases, just to give you a reminder eh, of what fractality was. But now I would like to, again, show you some more details on numerical techniques of how to obtain fractal dimension. So the, the best way, if I, many times people ask me, what is the best way of calculating fractal dimension? I tell you, the best way method is the so-called sandbox method. The sandbox method, you choose one side in the center of the cluster, the percolation class, whatever, choose one side, then you put concentric boxes, and then you ask in each box how many sites you find, this number you call M of R, and then you plot R is the radius of the side of the box, okay? And then you plot in a log-log plot M of R as function of R. And then you get a straight line, and the slope of the straight line is the fractal dimension. This is the most, the most, uh, the easiest way to do it, and it's the one that converges the best. There exist many other ones. You can do it with ensembles. You can do it with correlation functions, but then there exists also the so-called box counting method, which is not the same as the sandbox method. The box counting method here you put on top of your cluster, you put a grid, and this grid has a certain size epsilon. Okay, here, this is epsilon, weight of the grid. And now you choose, you choose different grid sizes. You put grids, smaller grids, and smaller grids, and smaller grids. And each time you count, if a grid is occupied or empty, and you count how many grid points are occupied. The number of occupied grid points is an epsilon. And then you plot, Logarithmically, an epsilon is a function of epsilon or one over epsilon, but better. Here, this is sorry, this is a one over epsilon, and this is n of epsilon, and you get a go again straight line, and the slope is again diffractal. But this method is not so precise because you have problems with boundaries, because you have boxes that have only one, one side, other have five sides, etc. So, this method I will not recommend, but this method has a certain advantage. Namely, you can make it more general and say, let us now define a measure and measure a number which tells me how many points are in my grid. I mean, I'm not just asking if it's occupied or empty. I ask if there are three particles, or five particles, 10 particles. And P of I is the fraction of particles that you have in a grid, yes? So this now, this uh, you introduce this measure, and then can, you can also study the moments of this measure, the Q's moment of this measure P of I. And this measure is, measure is P of I, and this is the Q's moment of my, my measure P of I. And uh, now you can study how these moments depend on the system size and depend and define a fractal dimension for the moment. If the moment is zero, if you have put here Q of zero, yeah, then this here is a zero, and then it would just be one or zero if it's occupied or empty. And so we come back to the old story. This is what we have done to calculate fractal dimension. So D zero is the fractal dimension, as I said, of the support on which everything lives. The measure lives on this fractal object, yes? But you have now the richness that you can study the properties of the measure. 
And in a generic normal case, again, all these Qs are related to each other. Yeah, it's a linear function relating them, but not always. Some cases, and these are we are discussing, we discuss it later more. Some cases, these, these dimensions are each of them an independent new exponent. Yes, and this is what is called multifractality. Multifractality does not mean that you have several fractal dimensions on the same plot or that you have several slopes. No, this is a sometimes write this paper, but this is wrong. Multifractality means that you have a measure on your fractal, and this measure has a property that each of the moments has a different exponent. Any question? So this is, yeah, sir. Okay. Um, all the measures is with theory of Hausdorff measure or uh, with dimension, fractal dimension is about other topology theory. I have this question. <laughs> no, I mean, this is unrelated to the Hausdorff measure. This is a, I mean, a measure, a measure theory is, a, a measure is a general concept. A measure theory is it's, it's an object which is between zero and one, and the sum is one, etc. So Hausdorff measure is another measure, I agree. But this here is not what is called Hausdorff measure. Okay. This is a, yeah, in that case, a measure of a point set, yeah. Okay, so um, yes, now I will give you an example also of this multifractality. The example is the so-called Hedon map. I guess that some of you have heard about the Hedon map. You have here a, um, a sequence, two numbers, X and Y, and they follow a recursive relation, which is nonlinear because you have a square. And so this gives you now, if you plot Xn as a function of Yn, you get plots, dots, many points, 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 points in space. And this object is called a strange attractor. Okay, and you see these parameters I showed you there. And the strange attractor, this hidden strange attractor is a multifractal object. It means if you want to calculate this fractal dimension using the box counting method, you will find out that uh, there exist regions which are self-similar, but it's not the self-similar in all directions. It's a self similarity that goes towards specific singularities in space. So they look different from classical fractal of self similar objects. And now, if you calculate the moments of um, this P of Q, then you will find the dimensions as function of Q are a continuous function. So, this is a classical example for a multi fractal object. Okay. Good. So now I would like to finish my fractal discussion about the concept of volatile fractality. Yeah. And I will. It's a big problem, no? Okay. I know, I know. For a cut. Go. For a tas. Asi. Dame un segundo. Bueno. Sí. Espera. Yo voy a hacer ahora. No, dale. Y por acá. Bueno, déjame ir aquí. Ok, vamos a ver si funciona. Ok, so, so, uh, I would now show you an example, very simple example of why in percolation, the fractals are not so simply just that you have a cluster that you take and it's there. It's uh, volatile. Huh? Lo apagó. Más volumen. No sé cómo se va. Está esta vaina. Sí. El volumen. Aquí ya lo puse aquí. Sí. Aquí está. Bueno, ahora. Ya con eso ya. Vamos a ver qué. Yo creo que sí. Ya. Ya. Bueno, bueno, bueno. Ok, listo. And so, so look at what happens here. I have now a small system of different size. And so in a system of a small size, I have here my shortest path. Now I make a larger system. And now in this larger system, my shortest path is here. I make a larger system here, and my shortest path is here. So what was part of my shortest path in the case of L1 is not any more part of this case L2. So this means the character of who is the cluster depends on which size you are. 
This is what we, I call here volatile fractal. And this will explain why some dimensions can be smaller than one. Yeah, you will see that. Okay, so this is my small, small um, introduction or discussion on fractality. And now uh, let's come back to circulation. So in percolation, there exists another important function, which is the correlation function. The correlation function tells you with which probability two sites at the distance r are connected to each other, where connectivity has been defined in our model. Connectivity is part of percolation. So in fact, you can also say, what is the probability that two sites at the distance r belong to the same cluster? Because this was the definition of connectivity. And so what you want to do, in, if you have to calculate this correlation function, is you take a site in the middle of your cluster, and then you create a, again, no? You create two shell, a shell, a shell of radius r, and then a radius shell of radius r plus delta r, and then you ask how many particles, or how many, yes, how much of my largest cluster is in this shell inside, this uh, is number, and then you look at how this number um, changes with distance. So this is now, you take now the mass, uh, the, the, the mass in this one shell. No? I mean, M of R is the mass in the entire sphere. So this is the mass, this, the difference between the two is the mass in the shell. And all this is nothing but the volume or the inverse volume of the D-dimensional shell. So this is uh, just a prefactor. So this is all you need. You need to know just what is the probability that uh, I find a site in a shell of distance r. And this correlation function has the property that usually it decays like an exponential function, a very simple exponential function. Yes, usually. And this uh, decay is uh, described by a correlation length, which is xi. This is like also in the icing model. But now, uh, this correlation length diverges when you come to PC. At PC, it diverges, like have many things diverged. And again, you have critical exponents, and the critical exponents of the correlation length is classically called mu. Now, this is a classical name. So we have this kind of law that you have to now remember, because this is, will come all the time now when we discuss the finite size effects. Okay? So, what finds what happens, of course, at PC itself is that the correlation function is not anymore exponential, but decays like a power law. And again, we have an ex power law exponent that appears here. So it's always the same story. But now we can use this fact to extrapolate to infinite systems. Because in our reality, we can only deal with finite systems, but we want to know what happens in infinite system. And this we can do now by using this fact, and I will tell you this story. So uh, the finite size effects, when you have a finite system, don't allow you to consider any physics in which the correlation length is larger than the system size. So when the correlation, when the system size L is of the same size as the correlation function, then you everything that is inside this region here cannot be trusted anymore the critical region, because the correlation length in this region is larger than the system size. So you, everything you do is wrong, okay? So you have here some round off. Maybe we'll see in a real numerical work an infinity. Actually, a computer cannot do that anyway, but in finite systems, everything is finite. And so you have typically a round off. And so you now have to see how can I estimate the size of this critical region? And for that, you know, it's an example, it's typical the simulation of a three-dimensional system. Yeah, this is the correlation length uh, in, in a cube. But now, in order to estimate the, the, the critical problem, you will see here, this was what we had. The, the, the issue com started on L equals the correlation length. Then we have a breakdown of, of our results. Yeah? The correlation length grows like P minus Tc to the minus nu. So the size of the critical region yeah, if you put this on the other side, grows like L to the minus over nu, this distance here. Yeah? And so if you want to extrapolate the 
to get the PC, the infinite size PC, you have this kind of relation. There is a, this is the PC of the infinite system. And the PC that you measure somewhere in this region by looking at the maximum of, the, of this function is given by the infinite PC plus a correction that goes like L to the minus over nu. So you know exactly how to extrapolate to infinity. And this can be used directly when you have data date, then you make, oh God, when you make a finite systems, so you have here different values that you obtain as PC, as function of the system size. So different system sizes, you have different values. So what you do is you plot them as function of A to the power one over nu, and then you will extrapolate and you get then the value here of infinity. So this is a much more precise way of obtaining the PC in the thermodynamic limit. There exists an even more precise way, which is what is called the gradient percolation, which uh, was invented by these people here in Ecole Polytechnique. And what you do here is the following. You take a system, square lattice, but now the value of P changes as function of X. So you take here, you take P equals one, here you take P equals zero, and for instance, and here you take P continuously, let's say varying from here to here. Okay, and then here, of course, you have an infinite cluster. Here you have nothing, and there's a frontier between the two, which is where the infinite cluster ends. And this frontier is at PC. If now you make this gradient smaller and smaller, yeah, then you get more and more precise in the, in, the, in the determination of PC. And so this method, I mean, we know how this decays, everything is known. You have here, uh, the density of the infinite cluster. And then you have this broad region here, which actually is this uh, separation between percolating and percolating and non-percolating. So this is a very rather complex line. Yes. And uh, uh, here I show you how you extrapolate then with a gradient going to zero, you can extrapolate and get very high precision in PC. This you can do also in three dimensions, of course. In three dimensions, the surface that you have has the same fractal dimension as the cluster itself. In two dimensions, things are not like this. In two dimensions, we have uh, that the perimeter of the infinite cluster has a very interesting uh, properties. You have its fractal with the fractal dimension of uh, seven over four, which has been obtained by Saleur. And um, then if you jump over the, the fjords, if you don't take the full contour, the full contour, then you get what's called the accessible perimeter, which has an even smaller fractal dimension. I will, I make this very fast because later I will talk about that in more detail, okay? I mean, this is just, a, just to flash it in, to make you aware of this fact that there exists this kind of perimeter problem, which we'll discuss later in, the ter in terms of uh, schramm Löwner, et cetera, in more detail. Okay, but let's come back to our final size situation. So uh, the most powerful tool in dealing with finite sizes is now what is called finite size scaling. So the scaling law, like the one we had before, the Stauffer scaling law for cluster sizes, there exists also a scaling law for the size dependence L. So you have, for instance, here this function psi, which we had introduced before. This was this second moment, which depends on two parameters, P and L. And then you can write down a scaling function which depends only on one parameter, P minus PC to the power L to the one over nu. And uh, this law is, of course, it was invented, was discovered for the icing model by Ferdinand and Fisher, and is also valid for percolation. And this is an extremely powerful uh, law. It is the most efficient way to obtain the critical exponents numerically because you can again do a data collapse. That you can again plot uh, this, this divided by this as function of that argument, or this, this plot here. And you see then all data for different L and P collapse on these two curves. This curve is here above PC and below PC. So if on both sides you have this law, you put it in, in, in double logarithmic form so that actually you can even make some information about the slope. So it's a very powerful technique because if you change the 
exponents a little bit, everything breaks down. So you get this collapse only when you have these exponents and mu and gamma over nu well chosen. So this is why I'm saying this is the, the most precise way of obtaining the critical exponents. As a corollary, you find that the maximum of this uh, function at PC grows like L to the gamma over nu. Because uh, if I set in at PC, then this is zero, then this is a constant, and then you have this law. So the same thing can be done for every function of percolation, not only for the second moment, but also for the order parameter, of course. So the order parameter, which you remember we called big P, which was the probability to find a site in the largest cluster. This uh, also follows a similar scaling law, finite size scaling law. And uh, again, if I set P equals PC, and this becomes now a constant, we see that this probability, this order parameter goes, uh, um, goes to zero when the system size goes to infinity in this way, with an exponent minus beta over nu. Okay, but you remember that this infinite cluster was fractal. And this fractal dimension was defined like this, that the mass of the infinite cluster grows like L to the diffractal. So the mass of the infinite fractal is nothing but the probability to find a site times the volume of the system. So M infinity is nothing but the order parameter times the volume, times L to the D. And you know that the order parameter goes like L to the minus beta over nu and plus D, and this should be equal to M infinity. So we have that D fractal equal to D minus beta over nu. As I promised to you before that I'm going to show this to you. So it follows directly from the finite size scaling property of the order parameter. Good. So I will close now my introduction to percolation by just mentioning that there exist also ways of producing percolation clusters individually, not just by making a configuration by throwing uh, randomly particles or not, but by making one cluster. And there are one thing, two things. There's a leaf algorithm. The leaf algorithm is the following. You start with one seed, and then you look at the neighbors, and then you occupy the neighbors with probability P. And then if you have decided that they are not occupied, you will never ask again. So you have to only, every site has a chance only once. And then do that for all the neighbors every, every time you have a surface of this cluster and you go through this entire surface and each site you ask if it is occupied or not. And so you grow the cluster like this, this is simple. And invasion percolation is a little more, more, <laughs> more physical also. Here you have your, uh, the first site you occupy, and then you look around at your neighbors and you occupy always the site which has the smallest value of P. And you, uh, you first use, the, sorry, you have to say first, first you throw, put on every site, you put a value of P randomly. Yeah? And you have a, what is called a quench situation. And then you look at the neighbors and look always for the smallest value of P so that you grow always in the direction of where you can find the smallest P's and so it does not just grow like a, bar, like, like a blob. It grows in one direction where it finds, where it can obtain the smallest values of P. So this is a, an avalanche. It, it moves in avalanche forward. But this is just a remark about um, what can be done, but I will not follow this whole more. So now I come to the, the second chapter of my talk, of my course, which is uh, the dynamics of percolation clusters. So as I told you before, one application of percolation is a mixture of conductors and insulators. Or you can also make a mixture of conductors and superconductors. But in these cases, what happens is you have a mixture of conductors and insulators, yes? And in particular, the conductivity of each uh, individual conductor is unity. So all conductors have the same conductivity, and this conductivity is one, yes? And then you apply to your system a potential drop. So these ones, the, the black ones here are the occupied sites. This is bond percolation. And the white ones are the empty ones, no, the empty. 
And you see there is a connecting path from here to here, which is the black one, the very black one. Yeah? So the current flows through this black part. Okay, so of course the conductivity depends on the probability P of occupying a bond. Yes, if I have a too few bonds, I have no spanning cluster and then you have no conductivity. So below PC, the electrical conductivity is zero. And above PC, it grows as you could imagine with a power law with an exponent I call T. And this T is also known with quite high precision. We obtained this it was a special purpose computer in Saclay, we call it Pedicola. And this is how we got these, these very high exponents. So it's very well known, but it's only known numerically. And if you take a mixture of conductors and superconductors, then what you have is that the conductivity will diverge when you reach PC. So in analogy, like the viscosity in the gel diverges, and the shear modulus goes to zero. Here, when it comes from there, we have here the conductivity in the two cases. Okay, and in both cases, you have a critical exponent. So this is a physics situation. Now, what, how does the cluster look like? What happens on the cluster? So here I show you now a simulation result of a, a typical cluster where I apply a potential drop from top to bottom. And from this, on this side here, I have periodic boundary conditions. So it's, here is periodic and here is a, a metal, metallic plate here and a metallic plate here. And uh, what you see is every side that is not black belongs to the infinite cluster. But the current only goes on the blue ones. Yeah, because I mean, have this, as I looked before, we have, oh, sorry, oh, that's not so fast, okay. So these ones here have no current. No, these ones here, they are the so-called dangling ends. Yes, and these are the ones that I've in here made in green. So all the green ones are dangling ends, which carry no current, current is zero. Yes, and then you see there is this white line. In this white line here, this is the shortest path that goes through the cluster. And along this shortest path, you can see some red points. Here are red points. Here red, you see these red here? Some, sometimes there's some red also here, yeah? And these red points here, they are representing the red bonds. This is why they are red, yeah? They are the cutting bonds also. These bonds are the ones that if you cut, cut them, if you take them away, there is no current anymore. That means the entire current flows to these uh, red bonds, okay? So this is the structure of the infinite cluster under the action of the current. So as I said, we have now removed uh, the dangling ends and then remains the blue part. And this blue part is called the backbone. This is now a very important concept. Yeah? The backbone is the current carrying part of the infinite cluster. And the backbone actually, again, it has a fractal, but its fractal dimension is smaller than the fractal dimension of the infinite cluster. It's a fractal subset of a fractal object. Yeah? And uh, the fractal dimensions, as you see, again, can be obtained. And then you have the red bonds, the cutting bonds that I showed you, yeah? also called red bonds. And these red bonds are also fractal. And their fractal dimension is one over new. One over new we have seen before. Nu was the exponent of the correlation length. And as you might remember, nu in two dimensions was four thirds. Now, one over nu means is then three half, three fifth, three fourths, 0 0.75. So the fractal dimension of the red bonds in two dimensions is smaller than one, which means that if you make the system larger and larger, the density goes down. Yes, this you can only explain through the volatility that I explained to you before. That means that if you make your system larger and larger, it's much more difficult to find a, a, a red bond. So, so this explains why the exponent can be so small. Okay, now you can analyze how are how does this black this backbone? What is the structure of this backbone? Yes, and when one looks in detail, one finds that there is this here. This is a like a necklace, like a collar. Ne? We have here along this shortest path. You have these blobs, you have 
the red bones, and then you have some kind of blobs. Yes? And so if you look at now the probability to find a sequence of, of blobs of the same size, one after the next, then you see that this probability decays exponentially, which shows that this is a Poisson process, which shows that these blobs are put on the necklace in a random way, following the Paolo distribution as shown here. So this is now the blob size distribution. This is again a, a scaling law about how the blobs sizes are along, are organized along the necklace of the backbone. And you see here, this is now the exponents here tau. Here is shown numerically, very well, very good data. You see a lot of orders of magnitude, yes, are smaller than two. I told you before that they cannot be larger, smaller than two because of mass conservation. Eh? But we don't have mass conservation here because of the volatility. So this explains that here we can have taus which are smaller than two. And indeed, we can even calculate this tau analytically in a closed form. You can show that it is, a, it is a related to the backbone fractal dimension. So in fact, this whole story has only one exponent. You can either look at it as a distribution of blobs or at the fractal dimension of the backbone. This is the only exponent which characterizes the backbone. Okay, the question to this? Not really, no. So now I would like to come to the next point of the backbone. Remember the backbone is the current carrying part, yes? So on every bond of the backbone, there is a current. I call this current I. And now I can study the distribution of currents. Yes, that means I can ask how many bonds are there having a certain current. I can look at the backbone and look at, at which, what every bond, what is the current that goes through. And then I can study, as I have already done before today, the moments of this current distribution. Okay, on the percolating backbone at PC, or they're always at the criticality here. Right? So what you find is clear that the zeroth moment, the i to the zero is equal to one, so this is why zeroth moment, of the current distribution is of course the backbone itself. Because every bond carries some current and then it's valued as one. Then the infinite moment of the distribution, yes, is the one in which you only uh, will will search for the highest currents, and the highest currents flow through the cutting bonds. The cutting bonds are the ones through which all the current has to go through. So this is the highest current. And so if you do this, then you only look at the current cutting bonds. And so m infinity is nothing but the cutting bonds, and so it goes with the fractal dimension of the cutting bonds, which I've introduced before. And the, the, in the moment now, this, this, the first moment that calculates the current to the system. So it is the current exponent of the, what you find here is the exponent of the electrical conductivity. And one can even go further as the work done by Ramal, I will not go in detail. One can also identify the second moment with what is called the flicker noise which is one thing which you measure the fluctuations, but you measure, for instance, semiconductors. And so we have now a hierarchy of exponents corresponding to the distribution of currents, which is actually a measure on the backbone, because on every bond of the backbone, I have this number, which I can normalize to, to be between zero and one. And so what is now interesting is that this current distribution for which we have now several values we know, know already eh, for this. This one is multifractal, which means that the exponents cannot be related to each other. And here you see the original data, like how it depends moment for moment as function of L. And this is now how the exponent depends on, on the K of the moment. I mean, this is the moment here, and this is the exponent, you see the continuous function. And to finish this story, I would like to 
cast all this in an other formalism, which is very common, but is not new in the sense that it does not give new information, which is the so-called F of alpha spectrum. So this, this F of alpha spectrum is what you find in the literature most commonly when you talk about multifractals, yes? But this is nothing but the Legendre transformation of what I've shown you before. So this is now, again, the same thing as I showed you here. This is the moments of the current distribution, which occur current distribution and voltage drop is the same thing because the conductivity is one. Eh? And here we have now these exponents that I, had, I showed you before, I call them now tau, okay? And uh, if you now make a Legendre transformation of this uh, function of the exponent and function of the, of the index, yes, then you get what is called f of alpha, which then looks like this, yeah? And it's uh, analogous to showing d of q, and the same information, <laughs> but it, um, it uh, has a more physical meaning in the sense that alpha is essentially this local singularity that you have, that I showed you in the Hannon mapping that uh, what geometrically means multifractal, means that they are uh, different, in, in, they are multi, they are fractal subsets of my fractal object, which are accumulation points, which uh, let's say we have different scaling at different strengths for different accumulation points. So this is a, a geometrical interpretation and this you can better see in this algorithm called F of alpha. So this is just for those that ever tumble on multifractal papers that you don't get shocked that have not told about this F of alpha. Okay, so here we finish with multifractality. Uh, I don't know if there's any question about this subject. No, I'm too difficult, too fast. Yes, sir. <laughs> Can you just speak about uh, fault fractals? And I know that uh, self similarity is a condition necessary for, yes. for fractal. And when I think about the snowflake fractal or the counter set, uh, mm -hmm. there are rules. Uh, sometimes we're scaling rules. And when we do the zoom, uh, we see the same system. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not clear about uh, how is how is this is represented in a system with percolation. Exactly the same way. You take a percolation cluster of certain size, you reduce its re resolution by, let's say, made coarse graining. And then you look at the object, it looks the same. It's the same. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, just, just but of course, easy. smaller. It's, if you reduce by color, I mean, you have a system size L, you make coarse graining with a square, then you get a, maybe a L half, but a smaller size, but they have the same optical in the same way. Okay. I, could, I can show you, I have examples I can show you later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Um, so I would like to, since I have been talking all, all my old work, I would like to talk about some work which. It's just as I'm mean, just finishing. We just it's submitted to physical review E. Anyway, this is now a, a technique to calculate the current distribution on the infinite cluster. Okay, so what happens is that there is a, first of all there is a classic model which is used as a toy model for the backbone, which is a so-called hierarchical lattice, which is a and then where you make this kind of iterations that you always replace one bond by this kind of blob structure. And you go tuck, 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 you replace. And since this is a sequence of series and parallel uh, connections, you can do this analytically to the end. And you can calculate the multifractal distribution. This was done already by Cornelio in the 90s. Yes, for this exactly, yes. But unfortunately, things are not, but this unfortunately doesn't give the right result. And the reason is that this picture is too simple because you cannot decompose always everything in series and parallel. There exist the so-called three connected components, which are those pieces of a graph which you cannot decompose in series and parallel, okay? Here I have an example. This is my, 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 my graph, yes? Here is it from here to here goes the, the current. And you see that, that there are these three objects here that I cannot decompose further in these years in parallel. So this is uh, 
Now, these are these three compacted components I have to take out. And so the, the strategy now it is that these three component, components, of course, can be decomposed again, yes, in three compo connected components. So you have levels of decomposition. And uh, since the appearance of these three connected components is very weak, it means it increases with system size with a very small exponent, yes, uh, it is a small error that you make. This is why this looked quite nice, but it's not right. You have to take into account these three connected components. So uh, by decomposing now in these, 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 these very levels, one can, of course, separate the problem can, because each, at the end, you boil everything down to the lowest three con connected component. And so you can much more go into the depths and calculate much more and obtain Currents of the order of 10 to the minus 35, which is what double as before, before you could only do like 10 to the 15 or so. And uh, by doing this, now one can understand the origin of multifractality as a composition of two distributions the distribution of the uh, um, levels and the distribution of the factors that you have at each level. So, and being, being more precise, here, up, oh my God, sorry. Here, if I do a such a situation, then uh, the, this three co connect component will, of course, not receive the entire current, will only receive the current that goes through here. So, the, the, the potential drop here is reduced with respect to the overall potential drop by a factor. And for every of these components, you have a factor attached. And at every level that you decompose, you have these factors. And if you now look at the distribution of these factors, yes, then you see that these factors are distributed according to the power law with an exponent three fourths. So this is the real scaling, classical scaling situation. But the levels, yes, that you have, the, 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 how many levels you have each time, the levels are distributed like an exponential function. And at the end of the day, the full distribution is a, connect, is a convolution of these two. And this explains why it is not a simple fractal, but it is multifractal. So this is, a, as I said, a recent work which pushes this to the, let's say, toward the limits. Okay, um, let me just mention that one can also introduce conductors which break at some characteristic voltage, so-called fuses, yes? So now, if it, in, in, if it, instead of having a conductor that conduce, conduces always, it breaks down when its current increases a certain value, okay? And if you do that, then you can, with this, simulate fracture. You can simulate the rupture of a system. So this is now, such a, again, apply, apply this kind of a current to such a, let's say, random structure. And uh, every bond now has this property that it has this fuse characteristic that it breaks down at a certain characteristic uh, critical voltage or critical current. Then the entire system would have such a behavior that first it goes linearly, then you get a, a certain curvature, you get a very strong fluctuations, and here the system breaks up completely. And this is, if you want, the simplest way of uh, describing a fracture or rupture of the system. And this is why actually this paper is cited very much. And you see here that the entire procedure occurs in avalanches. And these avalanches follow the power law, as shown here. It depends on system size. And the closing about this issue, I would like to measure that, mention that another problem we can study is diffusion on percolation clusters. So you imagine you put in a random walker on a percolation cluster, and you ask, how far does this random walker go after a certain time? And what you find is that at PC, on the percolating cluster, critical cluster, you get anomalous diffusion. That means that um, the time it needs to, to go to a certain distance is longer than in the normal Euclidean plane, because you have the fractal object, and this fractal object is tortoise pass, and you cannot really so easily escape. 
And so this D walk this, this is now larger than two. It's another critical exponent, if you want, the characterization of this random walks. And uh, you can also calculate, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the mean square distance of this walker. But now there exists a relation that is due to Einstein, the old relation. Einstein looked at the diffusion, and you can show that there is a relation, a Einstein relation, that relates the electrical conductivity to the diffusion coefficient. And in that way, you can now uh, go back to what I told you before about the electrical conductivity, and you can show, but I will not do this here, that this d walk is nothing but two plus the conductivity exponent t minus beta over nu. So the diffusion problem and the conductivity problem are both what is called scalar transport and have both the same exponent. Yeah. So this is the scale. How much time I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Good. So then let me come to the next issue. So um, this was scalar transport, and now we come to vector transport. Okay. So we will discuss random disordered solids, and in particular, we will discuss the elastic modulus of a random solid and what happens at the percolation threshold. Okay? So you now imagine that instead of having conductors on every bond, we have strings on every bond. And uh, if you do this, then life is not any more as simple as before because you need to consider lattices that have sufficient connections. Otherwise, they will just collapse. So you cannot consider the square lattice. The square lattice is not a candidate to describe an elastic solid. You need to reinforce the square lattice with additional springs that you put in the diagonal. Okay, this triangular lattice is a good candidate. It has enough springs. Because what is the problem? The problem is that uh, such a structure here, yes, of springs is sloppy. You can, uh, you can you, without stretching any spring, you can collapse the structure. So you need a reinforcement of the angles, which you can do, as I said, by putting, for instance, diagonal springs. This way you reinforce the angles. And only in this way you have a chance to have a finite shear modulus. Okay? So before we do any kind of a calculation in, 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 on this problem, we have to have the right kind of lattice, right, as they said. Um, but then here I can, once you have it, you can then of course study the elastic modulus as function of P again. I mean, we put in our springs with a random probability P, yes. So uh, there you find that there is a characteristic, let's say here it's written as coordination number, but this is analogous characteristic P below which there is no connection of springs that are rigidly responding. And above which, in which you have a finite shear modulus or a finite uh, uh, modulus, and all these modulus, I mean, are related to each other somehow. So, in order actually to achieve any kind of rigidity, your structure must consist of what would be called trusses. It means of substructures which are reinforced like this, like this, or like in three dimensions, like that. Only these kind of structures are able to transmit let's say, torque or uh, force, and to be stable. Eh? And so what happens if you do this now? Eh? What happens is, suppose you're now here in a triangular lattice, eh? and you do this uh, percolation problem, it means you remove or you consider uh, a certain fraction of occupied sites, and you ask how many sites or how many bonds I need to occupy with a spring in order that my overall structure be rigidly responsive, be have finite shear modulus, yes? And what you find is that you need much, much more springs than you need for classical percolation. So the red line here is the order parameter of the classical percolation I talked before. This is now P, eh? and this is here the uh, threshold of uh, tri triangular bond percolation, yes? And the black line is the order parameter 
of rigidity percolation. That means this is now the spring when you do this problem, you have a, a PC which is my six point six point six point six six. So the PC goes up from three point zero point three four to zero point six six in order to be a to be rigid. Yeah? And then you can of course calculate the shear modulus. This has its own exponent, which is uh, also studied, yes. And uh, interestingly, the exponents that you obtain for the fractal dimension of the infinite cluster or for the correlation uh, from length exponents are not in agreement with classical percolation. Not, not really in agreement. I mean, this, there is a discussion in the literature still if one would make huge systems, if maybe this would go to 1.89 and this might go to 1.33, but it's probably unlikely. So it looks very much that this is a new universality class as opposed to before, where always, before always we had the same exponents. And I told you that it doesn't matter if you take a different lattices or different side bond or different correlation, connectivity definitions, you always have the same exponent. So here we have the first example where this is not really the case anymore. Uh, now I uh, have another con concept as I introduced this many years ago. Uh, the elastic backbone is what would be responsive elastically if we have now a square lattice without reinforcement. I mean, suppose my system is floppy. Yeah, still I can pull on this system. And if you pull long enough, you will have an elastic response. When all, this, all these floppy springs at the final of the end have been stretched, you have some response. So I define what I call here the elastic backbone, which is the, sub, the set of all the shortest paths. Because when you stretch a floppy system of springs, the first thing that will stretch is the shortest path. And so you look at the response, elastic response of the shortest path. Well, you have, of course, uh, seen that below PC, there is no response, clear. At PC, the shortest path was fractal object of a dimension very small. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so this is uh, now already above PC. You see there you have a very tenuous set of, this is the, no, the set of all the shortest paths, yeah? Of the shortest paths only. I mean, there are many paths that go from top to bottom, but there's only the shortest ones. And then you come to go with P higher than PC, PC higher, higher. You come to P equals 0 0.75, which is much higher than PC. And then suddenly this, uh, uh, this one dimensional object suddenly becomes compact. I mean, suddenly there's a transition, but not the percolation transition, another transition, higher PC, at which the elastic backbone becomes a compact object. It means at which it becomes, let's say, it's the probability to have a side on the backbone, elastic backbone is not anymore zero. So a new order parameter is now the probability to have a side on the elastic backbone. And what you find is that this probability here has a with zero below 0 0.7 about, and only about this is positive. So, so we have now two transitions. The first one at PC, at which the elastic backbone becomes a, the shortest path, which is fractal dimension of 1.13 in two dimensions. Then if you increase PC beyond P beyond PC, above PC, the fractal dimension goes down to one. So 1.13 to one until you reach P equals 0 0.7. And then, whoops, it becomes an object which is compact. But at this value here, 0 0.7, at the critical point here, the fractal dimension of this elastic backbone is 1.75. So we have a dimension 0, 1.13, 1, 1, 1.75, and 2. This is, if you go from zero P to P equals to one. This is the elastic backbone. And I show you more details about this now, then we finish. So first thing you can do 
is you can determine this new transition at 0 0.75 with 0 0.7 with high precision using so-called Binder cumulants. These Binder cumulants, these are these, um, these, these objects invented by Binder, which I will not discuss here more. These Binder cumulants, they cross for different system sizes at a very sharp point. And this gives you a very, very high precision of this critical point. This is the numerical detail. And then um, you can look, as I said, at the fractal dimension at different situations. This is the fractal dimension exactly at the critical point that I just determined, 1.75. Yes. And this is the fractal dimension between the classical percolation threshold and, one point, and, and, and the new one. In the region, you know, between the two, the two transitions, the, uh, the elastic backbone has a fractal dimension of unity. Yes, this is for two different kinds of lattices. I mean, so showing that it's independent on the lattice, this kind of calculation. And um, this is now the, um, the second moment. Yes, is the second moment uh, gives you a gamma value. Yes. And this you can obtain much better by doing a finite size scaling. So this is the finite size scaling. No, here. This is the finite size scaling for gamma. Because remember, I told you this finite size scaling techniques here. So I mean, I did this introduction this morning that you remember everything I showed you now. So this is the finite size scaling. Here you see, so you can very precisely obtain gamma and mu. And you might recognize that they are completely different numbers than you had before. Mu is now two. You remember it was 1.33 for the classical case, so very different. And then you can also do the same finite size scaling analysis for the order parameter, this order parameter. And then you find here exactly the again exponent is only 1.5, so 0 0.5. So again, different. So we have this second different universality class at this other exponent. And uh, you know, this is the three phases. You have phase uh, spherical phase, and you have this zoom phase. Anyway. So I think we have uh, talked a lot. I can stop here. Eh? So I hope it's uh, too, not too much. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any questions? We can make it. Sí, es fácil, sí, te pueden preguntar en español también. Sí, sí. <ríe> Diga. No especifica cómo es la interacción entre dos, eh, entre dos celdas vecinas. La, la interacción, digamos, nosotros definimos que cuando dos celdas vecinas están ocupadas, están conectadas. Uh -huh. Esa es la definición. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es lo que no entendí? ¿Qué, qué es lo que... O sea, a lo que veis que, por ejemplo, con los dos ejemplos que puso uno con el... Creo que era un condensador y otro con, con el de rigidez. Pues, ah. digamos, físicamente uno diría que las interacciones que ocurren entre una y otra no son tan parecidas. Entonces, pues, a lo que hoy es, digamos, esta teoría no... A la conductividad, no es, dices que la conductividad no es, no, es una interacción diferente de la... Sí, del resorte. Uh -huh. Claro, Entonces, digamos, la, digamos eh, son digamos, la respuesta, la, el cálculo obviamente es diferente porque el, tiene, la, el resorte tiene más grados de libertad, ¿no? Pero, eh, digamos, eh, la conectividad, eh, ocuparlo, es decir, que está ocupado o no, y que los sitios están conectados o no, es independiente del. Del, digamos, del objeto que tú pones en una, una, una conexión, ¿no? Mm. Es en dos, una cosa es la estructura, es que es la geometría, que dice cuáles, son conect, cuáles están conectados con cuáles, y otra cosa es la dinámica encima del fractal, que es, mm. la, que es, que es independiente. Bueno, gracias. ¿Sí? Eh, no me lo... Bueno, eh, Sí, cuando ustedes hablan de conexidad, eh, ¿es la misma propiedad topológica o hablan de conexidad por caminos? Cuando hablan de un fractal, eh, ¿le sirve que el fractal sea compacto? Hay, hay cositas como, hay unos detalles matemáticos que no me quedan muy claros porque 
Eh, cuando hablan de conexidad, no, no me queda claro el cuerpo topológico que están trabajando. No, yo trabajo todo aquí en el, en el espacio del cliente, ¿no? Aquí, es decir, eso es muy simplificado. Y obviamente yo no me puse a complicarme la vida con, con esos detalles patológicos, ¿no? De fractales compactos, etc. Obviamente existen, ¿no? Pero digamos lo importante, como digo, fractal compacto, la dimensión es de, del fractal como el, el camino aleatorio, ¿no? Pero, pero lo importante no es el valor de la dimensión fractal, sino el hecho de que son autosimilares. Ok, ¿no? Es. Preguntas. Después voy a hacer preguntas yo. No. Ok. Listo. Ah, siga. No me queda claro si en el ejemplo de, de conductor, sí. no conductor, se utiliza eh, bond percolation sin sí. nada más so. o se aplica digamos, como una especie de campo externo entre no, las dos placas. No, no, no es, no es no hay campo, sino simplemente se aplica un potencial eléctrico. Entendido. ¿Y la percolación es normal si seguimos teniendo las mismas probabilidades para toda la... Toda sí, la, percul la percolación es clásicamente como, la, como antes. Es clase de percolación hecho con un valor de P. Y ahora en, se imagina uno que las ligaciones, las conexiones son metálicas puede construir las metálicas, eso se ha hecho, hasta se han, han hecho experimentos. Y luego uno puede medir experimentalmente también la conductividad por ese objeto. Listo. ¿Sí? Eh, otra pregunta diferente. En sí. la otra, bueno, veíamos una forma de percolación que se llamaba LEAF, percolation. Y un de LEAF, el algoritmo de LEAF. ¿Tiene algo es, que es... ver con los modelos de Diffusion Limited Aggregation? que se utilizan para hacer uno puede hacer un modelo general en el cual eh, uno introduce un ex, un, la ley de potencia para el crecimiento y ese modelo general intro, eh, contiene tanto el, el dielectric breakdown es el DLA y tanto también eh, el LIS uno puede hacer una construcción así pero no es la misma cosa porque el, dielectric, el, el, el DLA funciona con la difusión ¿no? que son partículas sí. que difunden. El LIS, no, el LIS solo mira la superficie del clúster, los sitios alrededor de la superficie del clúster, y cada sitio de la superficie tiene el chance una vez de ser ocupado o no ser ocupado. ¿no? Y luego uno continúa buscando los sitios de la superficie, hasta que se agote, porque hay, el clúster es finito, entonces hay un momento en que no hay ningún sitio en que se pueda ocupar, o el clúster es infinito, ¿no? Crece, 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 crece. Entiendo. Muchas gracias. ¿Sí? Eh, entonces, ¿solo hay dos familias de universalidad asociadas a la percolación o hay más muchísimas, cosas? Hay muchísimas. Pero es la primera clase, ¿no? Okay. Después vamos a ver muchas más. Vale. Vamos a ver hasta que pueden variar continuamente los exponentes, los exponentes dependiendo de de otros parámetros. Vas a ver, eso todavía, todavía viene. Vale. Sí. No, I don't know if it's Spanish or in English. ¿En español de pronto? ¿Ustedes o...? Ok, when I was young and I was studying electrical engineering, no, I remember that was another tra another transformation, not just from series to parallel, but from star to triangles. Mm -hmm. yeah? And with that extra uh, transformation, it was always possible to to train any grid and transform it onto a combination of series and parallels. Uh -huh. Is that possible to to use that to solve the? This? It has not been done. Uh -huh. It has not been done. I know that this transformation can be done. I mean, it's a triangle. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can systematically do this for any three connected uh, component. I mean, if you can systematically evolve this or if you have any, I don't yeah. know this. I, never, I mean, the algorithm must be complicated, man. Yep. No. So I, I don't, I don't, I've never seen anybody Try to using do. this to improve the calculation of 
of the current distribution. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Yep. Niga. Um, so, so I know that um, this field, um, you you have uh, numerical simulations, um, but um, specifically to the elasticity case, do, do you know some experiments that are not numerical but uh, laboratory experiments related that are related to this field? Because I know there are um, 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 uh, different communities. No, so you are uh, there is uh, the whole community of uh, soft matter physics. So I know very different uh, um, interactions there, but um, are, are, are you, um, do you know any uh, experiments related yes, to these? Yes. To all these things, there are many experiments. I mean, the experiment, the even experiment, experiment was done uh, with a guy who took a metal grid and then with the scissors, he cut randomly bonds and then measured the current for different cuttings. This was done in, in, in Paris. But then, of course, there are people that measure the shear modulus of mm -hmm. objects uh, that are getting more and more sparse. Mm -hmm. And this is, yeah, of course. And the connectivity also is measure, measure of measurements of this, yes. There's a, even a, an experiment, it was in Marseille, where they took uh, beads, insulating beads and metallic beads and mixed them, and then they measured the connectivity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know that uh, the Minderford covalent sometimes is used, not practically always is used to to know uh, where the transition occurs. Exactly. Yes. And I know that uh, in some systems, for instance, in closed systems, this is this is uh, defined with the neighboring um, points of a of a of a single particles. If we, if we have six, uh, then. Uh, we know that we are in a perfect solid, in a crystalline solid, and when we increase the temperature and the crystal um, is destroyed, and the binder covalent is used uh, just to know the um, the how the symmetries are are, are lost. So uh, my question is in in the in the example that you show the binder covalent, which quantity is used uh, to compute uh, this 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 covalent? Uh, the um, uh, you, you show the one slide yeah, yeah show. to find a site in to find a site in the elastic backbone eh? was it here here no no uh, here eh? so yeah. this this m of e b is the probability to find a site in the elastic backbone which corresponds to all the parameters of this transition. Huh? And so this is the fourth moment divided by, it's exactly analogous to what you do in the Eisen model. The fourth moment divided by the second moment square. And okay. then for magic is cancers, and then you get everything going, but it's not even, you see, it's, this is not, I mean, I didn't go into this detail, but in the theory, if everything, if there's no correction to scaling, let's say, and now I'm talking to the specialist. Eh? With no corrections to scaling, then they should all go exactly to the same point. But since they are always for very small systems, there are corrections to scaling, there is a small deviation to see that, 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 that there is still a dependence here eh? uh, on, on the system size. So this is the crossing point still moves with system size a little bit. But this is because of uh, uh, co so the corrections to scaling. Okay. Thank you. But nevertheless, this is the most precise way of determining BC, of course. Yeah. yeah okay. That's the idea. I have a really basic question. Uh, in many books, no, talking on phase transitions. Yes, they try to classify the transition from an ordered state to a non-ordered state with, uh, with uh, mm -hmm. a symmetry breaking. But I remember Stauffer saying that percolation was one of one example of a phase transition without 
asymmetry breaking. What's now nowadays? Is there asymmetry breaking still there or is still not? It's somehow there is and there is not. I mean, there is, of course, in the sense of the POTS model, yeah? there is none because we have Q plus one. So you, what do you break? I mean, you cannot make a spin flip. <laughs> so, so it's not possible. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there is of course a symmetry if you want in the sense that either you have a connected face or not connected face. So the question what you define as symmetry. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, Stauffer was right because uh, we looked at the POTS model. Ah, okay. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Okay, if not, so let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, let's thank the guys. And see you after lunch. There are some, I know we have a picture. Yes, um, before you, we go to lunch, we are going to take a picture of everybody. So uh, here outside, there are some stairs, there's a nice, on, so I think uh, yes, yes, no, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Yo creo que la gente ya salió, ¿no? Me imagino, ¿no? Que ya... Ahí están los 12. Hay 12, wow. Vamos a sacar esto, pagar esto aquí. Pagar esto aquí.